Welcome to The Music Reel. I'm your host, Nicola Burton. I'm very excited about my conversation today. I have with me the Australian music legend himself, Mark Callahan, who's one of the lead singers of two iconic Australian bands, so The Riptides and, of course, Ganga Jang. Mark, it is such a pleasure to meet with you today. How are you going? I'm very well, thank you. Nikki, and thanks for the lovely introduction. That's very kind of you. Well, no, I'm very happy to talk to you. Now, I stumbled across Sydney Nights last week, and I have to, look, I really hate it because I keep singing it. I can't stop humming it. So it's one of those songs, and you seem to have this knack of creating these anthems. So let's start with Sydney Nights. I'd like to know a little bit more about it, I guess, what it's about, what it means to you, and how it actually came about, why you're sort of releasing it now. Well, Nikki, um, <clears throat> Sydney Nights is actually a song I've had sitting around for a while. Working in the business as I do as well as performing, it's always very hard to find time to finish things. So I've actually had this track in Genesis for about 10 or 12 years. And um, with a bit of lockdown time, a bit of time myself, I decided it was time to stop starting and start finishing. So I actually decided that I would, you know, go through some of my songs that I had sing there, <coughs> excuse me, and finish them off. So Sydney Nights was one of the first cabs off the rank. Um, it's a fairly simple song in terms of its, uh, you know, uh, chordal construction. Um, Lyrically, it really harks back to the days of Sydney in the uh, 1980s, um, bringing back some of those memories of, in my case, you know, coming down from Brisbane, the end of the riptides, forming Ganga Jang, um, you know, meeting my future wife, you know, another, yet another story in the heart of a big city, you know. So it's, it was trying to re rekindle those memories for people of what it was like to be out and about in Sydney in the, the sort of the heyday of the live music scene. I think that's what I loved about it. The In the video, you've got all these historic photos. And those of us that have been in the industry for a while, like, oh, I remember that, oh, I remember that. And the whole thing just sort of wrapped me up and I felt like when they talk about music being a healing mechanism, that's what your song was like for me. It really made me feel good. And, and, and in particular right now when our industry seems to be looked upon like a, an acceptable collateral damage, if you like, it was so nice to go, oh, look, a new song. I feel so good about this industry. So, number one, thank you for that. But right. let's talk about you guys. Your last shows with Ganga Jane were, what, January, February this year, before the crazy hit, How Lucky Were You? And you what? So you've got you and Buzz in Sydney, Robbie in Brisbane and Jeff in Adelaide. With yeah. the border restrictions, what's it looking like in terms of touring for you guys for the next well, couple of years, what are your thoughts? Well, look, it's looking pretty dodgy, obviously. I mean, and that's the bad part about being in our industry is that basically we're the first out and we'll be the last back in, really, in, in a meaningful sense. I mean, gigs will come online with reduced crowds. We've seen that already. But in term, well, we all know what it's like touring. I mean, you really need that last 50 or 100 people in the door to actually make any significant money or profit, as it were, for the band. The rest goes towards costs. So um, it's very difficult when you're trying to tour when you've got reduced audience or potentially reduced audience sizes. So, yeah, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be a while, I think, before all bands are out there and uh, back to full potential. I think there's one potentially small silver lining, which might be the period between when it's okay to tour locally and before all the international acts come back in. So there might be a nice sweet spot there of a, maybe – 8, 10, 12 months when we might have the Australian market to ourselves as Australian artists, which I think would be lovely for, for bands that have been doing it tough for so long to go out there and not know, not realise that, um, you know, the inter international acts are coming through and charging those huge prices and sort of taking all the money away from the touring acts. So that, that's a good, that's an upside, I think. <clears throat> and that's the thing with this industry. Everyone I've spoken to finds that silver lining. And, you know, we're so creative in our ab ability to find creative solutions and finding that silver lining, like, as you say, giving Australian bands the opportunity to perhaps step up and have that experience before the internationals come back, I think, is a wonderful one. But let's talk about, I guess, your, you haven't just been on stage. You've worked behind the scenes for a long time. So you've been working with APRA for a long time. So I'm really curious to hear from you. Because everyone's talking roadmap to recovery, right? So there's three things our industry really needs to look at. So number one is the government, how it 
it helps us, what the assistance that they offer is. Number two is really how we future-proof as an industry moving forward. And then number three, how do we continue to make enough noise to keep the spotlight shining on our industry so people don't forget that if you don't have us, you don't have a soundtrack to your life. So from an industry perspective, Mark, would you mind telling me your thoughts on what's facing us as an industry? Well, there's a huge amount. There really is, Nikki. I mean, I mean, if you look at just the, the, the COVID scenario and what that involves, I mean, that's really surrounds, it mostly impacts obviously on live music. Um, what we have found is during the, the, uh, the lockdown periods around the country, people of, you know, musicians and composers have, you know, retreated to their studios and they've actually producing, been producing lots of work. So that's really good from a creative standpoint. It's the live aspect that's really difficult. And you mentioned government there. Government's a very interesting sort of jumping off point for a discussion because, you know, on the one hand, the music industry and every artist, every composer, they are essentially a small business, as we know. And we've long lobbied government that we want to be regarded that way. You know, they always tend to, to just put us into the arts um, uh, basket. And, you know, if, the, if any time we go to Canberra seeking assistance, they always feel that it's sort of arts grants. It should be in the arts portfolio. And, and they don't particularly like that anyway. And, you know, aren't musicians all rich and they're all famous pop stars anyway, so why are we helping them? But really what it's about is the fact that every band, every single artist is a small business. You know, they, they learn those skills along the way of looking after their own bottom line, as you say, very creative thinking, con continually pivoting to try and find ways to work their way through the maze, both, both in terms of being recognised as an artist and developing their career, but also as a small business, you know, learning how to, to um, run their own books and to book their own gigs and to do all of the myriad of things that, you know, they're involved in running a small business, hiring staff, as in, you know, promo people or, or crew or whatever. So <clears throat> on the one hand, you know, government assistance yeah, is always welcome, but I think it really has to be seen from that perspective of small business, you know. Um, the government can also help, I think, in terms of regulation and around live venues. We've seen, you know, a lot of restrictions imposed on live venues, <coughs> excuse me, over the last <coughs> few years. And, um, you know, and we've seen a lot of venues close. And I think the pandemic is going to have the effect of increasing that pressure. There may be some venues and businesses that may not survive in their current form, um, enable, uh, enabling them to support live music. So you've got this, you know, government interaction with the arts industry. Um, it's positive. It's really good. And we, you know, it's really great what the government has done so far. But moving forward, I'd certainly like to see more regard for the arts, um, especially our area of it, as small business. And that would open up, I think, a, a bunch, a different, a different conversation with government. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's just one, in, you know, when you ask about what's happening with the music industry, I'm, I mean, I think that there's a lot of things happening beyond that in my area of the business, which is more about music publishing and what, what happens in that field. And I guess that's a slightly different discussion, but certainly um, the live aspect of, of performing, touring, playing music is the bread and butter for Australian artists and support from government to enable that to to break us, you know, they're always talking about, you know, getting through red tape. Well, there's so much red tape for touring artists and, and putting on music. If we could get past some of those um, barriers and get some genuine support from government, I think that would be a, a really major step forward. I think that's um, a really wonderful um, perspective to have, Mark. You've actually said what so many people have been thinking for years, it's a business and if you look at us like we are small businesses, we're SMEs, that's the best way to be able to support us. And that takes me to my next thing, which is all about data, real-time data. It certainly seems to me that the government's response um, demonstrates that they don't necessarily understand the economic data or the very real human data that our industry um, actually has to offer. $112 billion bottom line, 6.4% GDP, $250 million package, that's 0.22% value, which doesn't, those figures don't really add up. So I wonder if, and I'm not sure from your perspective, but a lot of people I've been speaking to have been saying, do the, do the government actually have access 
to the data about our industry so that they understand the very real economics that we contribute to the bottom line. What are your thoughts on that? Look, I think they do. I think they do have as they they uh, those figures are quoted often to them. I think there's some sort of um, mental barrier, and I think it really is about that arts versus business thing. And it's weird too because. On the one hand, most artists don't want to refer to themselves as businesses because, you know, obviously we're all um, creatives first. But underlying that is this um, very important um, bedrock of business. You know, to survive, you've got to be able to, you know, um, add your numbers up and you know, have enough turnover to pay the people that help you out and work for you, etc. So, yeah, it does seem quite a, you know, when you compare sort of, for example, assistance uh, in all areas, say, for example, given to sport, versus that given to arts and you see that the arts and the, the broad sector of the arts where everything from visual arts through to opera ballet you know live music contemporary music etc i mean <clears throat> it's just the number of people that are involved uh, the percentage of the population that regularly avail themselves of the arts as it were uh compared to those that uh, attend sporting adv- events i mean it's chalk and cheese you know I mean, there's so many more people gain there i think cultural nourishment from from the arts broadly and from music in particular so yeah it would be great but i i know i'm i'm not one of those for constantly putting a hand out to government which is why i think that any support you know you want to have it given on that basis of look you know we're serious we're a business we don't we're not here looking for handouts we're looking for a leg up you know looking for the kind of assistance that you would you give to normal inverted commas, small businesses. So that's the the angle I think is, or the conversation I think is most important to have with government. No, I love it. I love it. It gives it a completely different slant. And that's the beautiful thing about Sydney Nights. That's what I really liked about it is that it's this homage to our industry. Um, you, It's very optimistic. It, it, it's very positive. And I think that that's the way for us to move forward is to keep that optimism Yep. No, thank you, music. You are a healing mechanism and we're a business behind the scenes that made that music happen. And I think that's the way forward is to keep it optimistic and just say, look, whatever comes, we're creative. We're going to be able to work our way through this as business, like you very cleverly say. So, yeah, that's that's what Sydney Nights actually meant to me, Mark. So it had a, a big impact. So when's it actually going to be released? Let's let's talk, take so it. So it's out. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a frog in my throat this morning. <coughs> Um, it's it's out now. Um, it uh, came out last Friday, so it's out there in the world. And it's interesting you talk about. <coughs> excuse me, uh, Nikki. Um, it's interesting that you talk about uh, data. I mean, the the world that we're in, in in terms of releasing contemporary music, and this is again back in my face with the release of Sydney Nights. Things have tended to become extremely data driven. You know, I mean, you start to look at your streams on Spotify and your on your, your views on YouTube, and uh, it's very can become very um, all about the numbers. And I would encourage all artists to, you know, you've got to put that to one side because, you know, if you start comparing yourself to the really successful artists that are out there, you can get discouraged very quickly. You know. Um, people who are, you know, getting billions of streams and, you know, you're still trying to get to a 1,000. So, look, you know, uh, I'm lucky enough that I've done, you know, I've had the hits, I've had the misses, I've been high, I've been low. So I've got a very kind of real view of the world. And um, it's nice to hear, you know, that Sydney Nights has had a a lovely impact on you, which I, you know, which is great, which is the whole idea of the song. But, um, you know, trying to get beyond that um, immediate a uh, group of friends, the small people that you can reach immediately. I think it's the perennial challenge for all artists. Uh, and every time you go to the well, you know, every time you go and release a song and put it out there into the world, you're kind of faced with the same dilemma. And I am faced with that same dilemma again now where you go, how how are you able to break out from your own small sphere of, you know, friends on Facebook or whatever it happens to be? Um, you know, radio airplay is a challenge. Um but you just have to do whatever you can. You've got to do whatever you can. And that was the beauty of live, wasn't it, Mark, that you could go out gigging live and that would open you up to a, a bigger audience. Are you doing any shows? I'll let you get a drink of water for that frog. No. It's a <laughs> shocker. I don't know what's going on this morning. Frog. So have you got any live shows coming up in just in Sydney? Uh, Does you have a promoter? Is that completely not happening down there? 
no, there's nothing happening for me at the moment. Uh, there's a couple of things I might do solo, just so, you know, small appearances. Um, but yeah, it's there's there's nothing on that sphere that's going to sort of break this single out of that um, uh, immediate, uh, you know, release circle, if you will. I think is I don't know the best way to describe it, you know. But you've got to try and broaden that perimeter of, of reaching out to people. I'm you know reaching out to whatever radio airplay I can get, the same as every other artist at the moment, and um, we'll just see where it goes. At the end of the day, Nikki, you know, I mean. Um, I'm lucky enough to have had some hits and so that's great. And now I'm in the, uh, the phase of my career where, you know, it's really about just continuing to, to put out music, you know, um, continue to create that body of work. And, you know, a lot of people um, ask for advice about the best thing you can do for your music and promotion and all that aspect of things and ultimately the best thing you can do is hopefully just you know keep creating good music and you have to have some faith that in the fullness of time to find an audience i mean it's very interesting when you tell people that sounds of then was never actually a, a hit you know when it first came out it's a song that's just gradually reached out and touched people and become every year more and more um sort of popular so I, I've always got that to fall back on. So when I when I see my songs go out there and the initial reaction is, yeah, ho-hum, you know, um, it's okay because, you know, if it's, a, it's a good quality song, then in the fullness of time it'll find an audience. So given that we've had this incredible year of change in our industry, Mark, what's going on with music publishing? What are the changes that are occurring that artists may need to know about in order to, as you say, it's a music business, in order to make sure that they're on top of their music business? Yeah, look, I've had a long uh, uh, period working in music publishing. It's the main thing I've done on the business side of music, running different publishing companies. And over the period of sort of 20 four years working in that, in that area of the business, I've seen what has always been a very stable um, part of the business, kind of I always refer to it as the tectonic plates on which the industry is built. That has really started to change and, and that change has gathered momentum in the last few years in particular. And in particular, what I'm referring to there is the world of the, the especially the global music publishers and also the PROs, the performing rights organisations from, from different countries. It was always the case that the performing rights organisations were based in one country. They served that country and, and uh, there were reciprocal arrangements between all the different um, PROs around the world to, you know, uh, receive and remit royalties due to relative respective countries from each other, if you understand what I'm saying. So what, what's changing in that area is that we're seeing that, that, part of the business become a lot more um, competitive. It used to be that, you know, if you're in Germany, you know, your, your music publishing would be, your sorry, your performing rights would be with Gamer. If you're in Australia, it's APRA. In America, it's either ASCAP or BMI, SESAC, you know, there's five over there. But, you know, and we're now seeing that um, these organisations particularly are competing for members, which is a, a different thing. We're seeing the role that these, these organisations perform evolve and change so that they're becoming you know APRA for example is is putting a lot of work into promoting and helping to develop its writers for example by virtue of its song hubs programs where they put, put writers together and try and help them build networks as well as create new works which is a really great thing but you know you're seeing the major music publishers also moving into their, that area where you see a, a, an organization like Cobalt uh, who are a huge international music publisher, very good publisher. They have a, they started a company, I guess it must be, I'm going four years ago now, uh, called AMRA, which is a, a PRO. So here you have a, a publishing company that has a, a performing rights organisation. So these, these traditional boundaries are starting to change and evolve. And I think that that's something that maybe a lot of, um, your viewers, if they're in the, if they're artists in particular, may not be aware of, but there are significant changes occurring. And I think that they'll continue to occur over the next sort of four or five years, particularly. And I think that that change will, will increase uh, its pace. And I think that also organisations like APRA will need to be really on top of those changes to make sure that we're 
right on right at the front the cutting edge of the game it's so interesting that you should you should bring this up because really and i've kind of felt this while having these conversations i'm trying to not think in terms of australia i'm thinking in terms of the of the world and what you're just talking about now it's the same thing for a songwriter because technology gives us the ability to connect everywhere now their considerations for publishing is global they've got to have that global mindset by the sound of it so how is it going to impact their branding and their publicity in terms of connecting with that global market what do you think mark look i think the there have always been as i say the the, the pros the apras of the world and apra of course represents australia and new zealand we can never forget our wonderful kiwi brothers and sisters they they punch well above their weight in terms of uh, pretty much everything frankly um so you know there these pros sasm in france and you know Jazz rack in Japan, they're all sort of basically country based. But what we're seeing is that they're starting to go beyond their own boundaries and starting to offer services um, for their writers for the world beyond representing international catalogue in their own territory. So, um, for in APRA's case, what they're going to need to do, I, I believe, is that they'll need to just um, uh, focus very much on their own uh, writers. Uh, I mean, currently, of course, a, a large part of APRA's revenue comes from the repertoire that it rents, represents in Australia for overseas PROs. So I can see that that, 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 that income, because there will be a, a broad, a, um, a, a significant temptation for the major music publishers and potentially the international PROs to start to do direct licenses with the digital service providers themselves from their home territory so for example you might find ascap would rep would um, license their entire repertoire to for example spotify for the world and they would do that out of new york and uh, prs might do the same out of the uk and then you have the potential that the money that's therefore going via apra for australia for the prs repertoire for example would instead go directly to prs that has implications for organisations like APRA because it means that there's less revenue and it means that they will have to then uh, potentially either reduce overhead or reduce costs. But I, I also see that as a positive because what it means is, is that ultimately APRA must, I mean, it does to a large degree, but it must really um, focus completely in on the Australasian repertoire, Australian and New Zealand writers, because, you know, logically we could end up in a scenario where APRA might be licensing the Australasian repertoire globally. So, you know, this is the, the situation that we're in where it's quite unpredictable as to how it's actually going to play out and when some of these moves might be made. But I think, you know, I always tend to look on the, the positive side and see these challenges as something that, you know, if you have the right strategy in place, could be very positive for Australian and uh, New Zealand songwriters. It certainly sounds like, to me, an opportunity. Like, look, this whole COVID lockdown has been an opportunity. As much as it has been incredibly challenging, it's enabled people to see things from a different light. That's very interesting, Mark. Now, anyone who's listened to this conversation, is there some sort of, I guess, digital reference or resource point you could direct them to so that they can learn a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Because um, there's a lot in what you've just said, a lot. So there is. they're going to have well, to look the time. There, yeah, there is a lot there. I know, Nikki, and I'm trying to sort of gloss over a lot of um, sort of topics in one go there. Look, I think the best thing that, 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 that people watching this can do is to educate themselves, you know, and, and luckily the resources are there. So you can either subscribe to one of the music business sort of um, online journals um, there are, you know, lots of resources at APRA. If you go to the APRA website, you can look there uh, to find information. But I think also just Googling, you know, just researching online about, you know, what's happening in this space. I think that uh, would really help people give them a perspective about how or mm -hmm. where we as a country sit in the global marketplace in terms of the potential to... Um, to not just 
you know, act individually as an individual artist and how you're going to find that success for your own career. Mm -hmm. But also what we as a, as, as a songwriting community, what the potential is for us to work together through APRA to be able to access, you know, other markets in the world. You know, I don't know how these things are going to play out ultimately in the, in the sort of short term, but I certainly think it's important to understand the landscape because that's the reality. You know, you can dream as much as you like, but it is what it is in terms of the way that, the, that things are going and the way that um, other players will act in the marketplace. And I think that uh, knowing what's real and what's, ha what, what's likely to happen or what's potentially going to be um, how this scene will evolve just sets you up for a good, um, you know, sets you up well to position yourself and come up with a strategy uh, that will enable you to um, understand how you're going to move uh, going forward, you know, as they say. It's, look, I think it's a great time for us to have this discussion because we're not doing the gigs that we normally do, so we do have time. Yeah. And it, it's an opportunity. So, yeah, thank you so much for actually adding that to our conversation, Mark. No worries. Exactly. And I think that's the beauty of music right now is that we are focused on things that will keep us distracted. Whether you're out of lockdown, whether you're back at work, more and more people are connecting to music because it's helping them to feel better after this year from hell that everyone has had. Yeah. So I just encourage everyone to connect with Mark and listen to Sydney Nights. I loved it because it really, to me, spoke about the true essence of music in Australia. And I think at a time like now, that's what we need. So, Mark Callahan, I appreciate your time today and good luck with Sydney Nights. Everyone, make sure you go and download it. Good on you. Thank you, Nikki. Cheers. You're